We are in week two of our series called The Everyday Church. Uh, this is really a continuation of Vision Day where we, we're talking about our, our word for the year, which is engage. It is time to engage. Wherever you are gathered, turn to somebody and tell them it is time to engage. We've been talking about this idea, like how do we move from being passive observers to becoming passionate followers? And we, we talked about how we want to move from being the Sunday church to being the everyday church. And the everyday church is just simply based off of the life of Jesus, of modeling and doing what Jesus did. And it's engage with one, engage with three, engage with 12, engage with one another. Now, when you see that, if you're like, I have no idea what any of that means. I want to encourage you to go back and listen to Vision Day. February 7th is when we talked about all of that. And I'm not going to take time to talk about that here. But we are talking about becoming passionate followers of Jesus. So today I want to continue talking about engaging with one. Last week we talked about engage with one. And we talked about these eight core practices. There are eight practices that move us from passive to passionate. And if we'll do these eight things, then we know that there's going to be a passion for Jesus that's going to ignite within us. So last week, we talked about the first core practice, engage with one, daily devotions. We talked about this idea of planting the seed, the word of God, in your life every day in your life. Plant that in your life. And today, we're going to talk about core practice number two. And the second core practice is sacrificial serving. And Jesus gives us an example of this in Luke's gospel. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to go to Luke chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, I uh, just encourage you to download Version. That's a great app, and we use that all the time here at uh, Core Church. And uh, I'm going to be in chapter 7. I read out of the New Living Translation. If you don't uh, if you're new to the scriptures, you don't know, like, who is Luke? Who is, I, I, don't, I don't know much about this. Um, Luke was actually not one of the disciples. He was a doctor, kind of an investigator in a way, and he went around, he investigated all of the claims about Jesus. He was a, a follower of the early apostles, and so he talked to all the apostles. He talked to uh, eyewitness accounts, and he wrote down these stories about Jesus. And that's, we, what I love about Luke is he's very, very detailed. So if you look at Luke chapter 7, I want us to uh, read a story beginning in verse 11 where it says this, Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain, and a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. And the young man had died, was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Then he walked over to the coffin, and he touched it, and the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. And then the dead boy sat up, and he began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. One of the most amazing miracles in all of Scripture. So again, today I want to talk about engaging with one in this core practice of sacrificial serving. Let's pray. God, I just thank you for the moments that we have to be together in this moment wherever we are, um, spread out across the city, across the state, even around the world watching today. And we're just thankful that you work through the technology, you work through all the, the distractions. So many people right now know or have distractions where they are gathered. God, you have something you want to speak to each one of us, and I pray in these moments that when that moment comes of something you want us to, to hear and you want to impart that to us, that, God, we'd be fully focused You'd speak that word to us in Jesus' name, and wherever you are gathered, say amen. I think one of the most frustrating things in life are red lights. Anybody with me on this? I mean, have you ever been, have you ever, we've all been there. Like, you know you're driving up on, on an intersection and the light is green, and you know when it's green and you're like a quarter mile off from the light, you know what's going to happen. You know I am not blessed. I am not highly favored. That light going to turn yellow and then it's going to turn red. And it, it just does just in enough time that you can't speed up and go through the light. And you end up getting stuck at the intersection. Uh, it's so frustrating because we want to go. I think one of the funnest things to do, though, is when you're stuck at an intersection is, uh, is to watch people. Because people are just so interesting at intersections. I, one of the worst things I think that happens is when somebody pulls up even with you. By the way, that is not good proper stoplight etiquette. You should never pull up parallel with somebody because 
what happens is, you ever done this? You look over and you just glance. You're just glancing. You're not staring, you're glancing. And you glance over, and as you look, they look, and then they look at you like they think that you have been staring at them, and you're like, um, no, no, I, I'm not, I'm not. And, and you look back, and then you are kind of do that eye like, are they still, they're still looking, they're still looking. It's so awkward. How about the guy who pulls up with the subwoofer that takes up his entire back seat? You know the guy I'm talking about where it's, I mean, the earth is shaking, the asphalt is cracking, <laughs> your kidneys are shaking on the inside, and you're like, hey, dude, you look over at the car and you go, wow, guess you put all the money in the subwoofer, didn't you? Oh, man. How about the person... How about the person that's on their phone? You know the one, that, and by the way, there's nothing wrong. I don't, if you're at a stoplight, you got a moment, you can quickly return a text or whatever. That, that's cool. But the person who is constantly like looking down at their phone and they don't see that the light is turned green, and in that moment, you, go, you have a decision to make. Do, do I honk? Do I not honk? Do I honk? Do I honk? Are they going to go? Are they going to look? Are they not going to look? Are they going to look? Are they going to honk? Are they going to look? The light's turned green. Is it going to be? And it doesn't matter when you honk, they're going to give you that look. And you do the little, you know, the little beep, beep, you know, just kind of tapping the, the horn. You've done just a beep, beep. That's, it's kind of a courtesy thing like, hey, I'm not mad. Just need you to move. But it doesn't matter when you honk or how lightly you honk. You're going to get that look. We, we all hate sitting at intersections. Nobody wants to wait at an intersection because when you're waiting, it's frustrating because you've got places to go and you've got people to see. But what if intersections were not an inconvenience, but they were an opportunity. I, 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 I want us to think about this. I believe that God sets up intersections in our lives. He, he sets up these opportunities where our lives intersect with the lives of people who are in need of his hope, healing, peace, and purpose. I want you to write this down because this is where we're going to go for a few minutes today. Intersections are not an inconvenience. They are an opportunity. Intersections are not an inconvenience. They are an opportunity. But what happens to us is we get so busy, we get so focused on, on where it is that we're going that we miss so many opportunities. And turn to somebody in your neighborhood gathering right now and just tell them, don't miss your opportunity. Don't miss your opportunity. What's amazing about Jesus is Jesus never saw people as an inconvenience. Jesus always saw people as an opportunity. In fact, he, Jesus saw people as his mission. And I believe that as followers of Jesus, he's calling us to do the same, that people are our mission. Let's look back at the story here. We can see how Jesus shows us how to live this life of sacrificial serving that will move us from passive observers to passionate followers. Look at verse 11 again. This is the beginning of the story. It says, Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain. A funeral procession was coming out as he approached the village gate. A young man who had died was a widow's only son. Now, normally we just read this part of the story and we just move on to the miracle part of the story, but we can't just glance over this and brush over this and quickly go by this because, again, it's about intersections. It's about slowing down. And this encounter that Jesus has here, it's important to note that this was not by chance. This was not luck. Um, it, it, it was not by accident. Everything that Jesus did was intentional. And here's what's happening. Every single day, our lives are intersecting with other people. Think about it. You, when you are in your neighborhood and you, you come out of your house to get in your car and, and your life intersects with a neighbor who comes out of their house or they're out in their yard with their kids or, or they're walking their dog or you're at work and you pull into the parking lot. At the same time, one of your coworkers pulls into the parking lot. It's an intersection with people. You walk down the hall at work, and you happen to bump into somebody that's coming out of their, their office as well, or, 
or you're, uh, you're on your campus and you're constantly passing other students and your life is intersecting with all of these people. You're at the store and you get in that, that line, that checkout line, and your, your life intersects with the cashier. Our life is intersecting constantly with people everywhere that we go. And what if these encounters, what if these in, interactions, these intersections that are taking place, what if they're not by accident? What if, what if they are not by luck or by chance? I, I, what I believe is that God sees people in need and he divinely and he deliberately has our lives intersect with theirs. He wants our lives to come in contact with them. Think about this. Jesus is passing through this village on purpose for a purpose. I think we need to reimagine our neighborhoods as, as like a village, a place where my life is intersecting with people on purpose. Like it's not by accident that I'm outside and my neighbor is outside. It's not by accident that I pulled into work and they pulled into work. It's not by accident that I was walking down this hallway on my campus and someone else was crossing my path. It's not by, it's not by accident that you're in that checkout line and you're intersecting your life with the people in the line and the cashier in the line and the strangers all around. None of this is by accident. I believe that these are villages that God has set up for us where our lives are intersecting with people in need. And I believe this, you are there on purpose for a purpose because somebody somewhere needs the hope, the healing, the peace, and the purpose of God. Jesus. Come on, turn to somebody in your neighborhood gathering and tell them, you are there on purpose. You are there on purpose. This is what I love about what our core groups are doing right now. Over the next four weeks, every group, like you right now, are uh, some of you I know are in a virtual gathering. Some of you right now I know are gathering in homes, and, and you're talking about the core purpose that God has for you. Over the next four weeks, learning about gifts, learning about abilities, learning about your personality, learning about your life experiences, all of these things will help you to know how to better serve people around you. Like God has put gifts in you. There's certain gifts and, and abilities he's given to you that you can use. God wants to use that in somebody's life that it intersects with. You have a very unique personality. Come on, <laughs> Turn to somebody in your gathering and tell them, you have a very unique personality. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, yeah, you're taking that too serious. Okay, let's. I mean, we all have a very unique personality. And there's a unique way you are wired to engage with people. It takes all of us using our unique personalities. And here's the cool thing. You have life experiences. There are, it's when you, in week four of core purpose in your group, whether you're doing that virtually or you're doing that in person, however you're doing it, wait for week four. It's the best week. It's my favorite week because you're going to talk about your life experiences. There's good things and there's bad things from your past that God says, I want to repurpose that. I want to use it for my good in somebody's life. Something happened in your life like 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 15 years ago. You've, you've maybe forgotten about it. God's going to remind you of that. It might be painful, but God wants to repurpose that pain for his purpose in someone's life. And your life's going to intersect with someone. And somehow you're going to be like, wait a minute. This, I, I've dealt with this in, in my life. God's going to have your life intersect with other people. We've been saying this for over a year now, especially during this pandemic, is to remind us all, we are all missionaries. We are all missionaries. Turn to somebody and tell them, you are a missionary. You are a missionary. Come on, you, we are all missionaries on mission, on mission. The hope, the healing, the peace, and the purpose, that is our mission. The peace and the purpose of Jesus. We are all missionaries on mission, assigned to a mission field. You've got a village. You've got a place where your life is intersecting with other people. Have you, have you ever been going through an intersection and you're like turning left across traffic? And as you turn left across traffic, out of nowhere, you're like, boom, a, a, a car comes out of nowhere that you didn't see coming. And you're like, oh, my gosh, 
I almost died. It's just, you know that feeling where you're, you just get the goosebumps like from your, your toenail all the way through to the hair follicles on the top of your head. You're just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that just happened. Like you didn't even see them. Because either you were in a rush or maybe you weren't paying attention. I wonder how many times people are crossing our path, but we don't see them. I think what we've got to do is we've got to slow down at the intersections of life. We've got to slow down, and we've got to start looking both ways. God, who is it right now that you want me to minister to? Who is it right now, God, that you want me to serve? Write this down. Every day matters. Every day matters. Every interaction matters matters. Nothing is by chance. Every day matters. Every interaction matters. Nothing is by chance. Like for Jesus, this need was just, it was obvious, wasn't it? I mean, come on, you got, it's a funeral procession. You, you got mourners. I mean, these people are like, by the way, they, they pay, these are professional mourners. They'd actually hired mourners back in this, in this period of time. And they were, so they're weeping and they're wailing. Everybody's wearing black. There's a coffin going by. It's very obvious what's happening. But when we are presented with the needs around us, I think the needs around us, they're not so obvious. I think it's much more subtle. Well, the common greeting that we all use when we see somebody, you probably did this today when you gathered in your neighborhood gathering. You just, you walked in, what do you, hey, how you doing? And what's the answer we give? It's one of two things. It's either good or fine. But what I can tell you is people might be saying they're good and they might be fine, but they are not doing good and they are not fine especially right now with everything that has happened over the last year and everything that's happened even over the last couple of weeks, they are not fine. People are not okay. Listen, they, they may not be physically dying where you're, but I can tell you this, on the inside, people are dying on the inside. They, they may not be dressed in black, but I can tell you on the inside, things are going black. Things are, are growing dim and dark in their life, and they're wondering, does anybody care? Does anybody even notice me? Do I even matter to anyone? Here's the thing to remember. Just because there's movement doesn't mean there's life. This, this funeral procession, it was moving but there was not any life. Verse 13 says this, when the Lord saw her, that's the widow, his heart overflowed with what? Say it with me, compassion, compassion. It, it was compassion that moved Jesus to action. And it's compassion that will move us to action. So I want to say this, don't be compassive, okay? You're like, what? I just made that up. Brand new word, just coined it just a moment ago. Don't be, turn to somebody and tell them, don't be compassive. Work that into a conversation this week. Post it on social media. Don't be compassive, because if we get this worked up enough, maybe we could get it into the Webster's Dictionary by the end of the year. So, but what, what does that even mean? I mean, I made up the word. It's not even a word. Don't be, what does compassive even mean? You know what compassive is? Compassive people are people who see the need, but they don't do anything. Like, they see the need, but they, they make the excuse like, oh, man, I'd, I'd love to help, but I'm, gosh, I'm just, I, I, I don't have time to stop. I, I, I got to get to a thing, and, and oh, I'm really sorry, or, or oh, man, I, my, uh, my hands are full, or, or you know, I got this, and I, I, don't, I don't have the resources. I don't have, I don't have the, the time. I don't have the ability. I, I really wouldn't know what to, we make these excuses. Don't be compassive. Not only do they make excuses, but some people, they see the need. They just don't do anything. Because they don't really care, because they're so self-centered and so self-focused that they don't even really care about the needs. Or frankly, many people in the church today, man, it's just, are just 
indecisive and indifferent. Just indifferent to the needs. Huh? Yeah, I don't I somebody probably ought to do something about that. Don't be compassive. Here's the thing about passion. If you want passion, passion comes out of compassion. So if you want more passion, you got to have more compassion. So the more compassion you have, the more passionate you're going to be. And Jesus is saying, I want to move you from a passive observer to a passionate follower. And it was compassion and passion that moved Jesus to action. And look at verse 14. This is the act that he did. It says, then he, say it with me, he walked over. He took some steps. He went towards the boy. He went to the coffin and he did what? Say it with me. He did what? He, he touched it. In other words, engage. Come on, turn to somebody and tell them, it's time to engage. Jesus didn't just walk by, but he engaged with this family. And he's, he's surrounded, but think about this. He's surrounded by this crowd. He's, he's on his way somewhere. He's got people pushing and pulling on him. But this is what I love about Jesus. As we talk about engaging with the one, man, Jesus, this is who he was. He, he stopped for the one. He always had time for the one. And it says that he, he walked over and he touched the coffin. Listen, if you want to feel compassion, you got to get close. I, I remember when my life was radically altered by drawing close to poverty. And I don't, I don't say that lightly. I mean radically altered. Several years ago, we had a mission team, and we went to, to Zambia to do uh, some mission work. I was super excited about being there, and we... When we were there and we were doing some work, we went into one of the poorest areas of the capital city. And we were ministering at this church, and this church had been wiped out by a flood, and they'd, all they had was a dirt floor, uh, no roof. The roof had been torn off, uh, had cinder block walls and a small sound system. But what was amazing to me was the joy that they had. They had nothing, but they had so much joy. And I thought, man, we, we could learn a lot from them. Everything that we have, I mean, just like this ability that we have to even communicate this way, and somehow we get bored. I don't understand, but man, they had so much joy. But I'll never forget when I was there, and, the, and I was sitting in this church service, and this little boy, he's probably, I don't know, three or four years old, he walks over to me, and he looks up at me. And when he looks up at me, he kind of gives me the, uh, the international sign that, uh, you know, no, no language problem here, no language barrier. He just gave me that international sign of, pick me up. And so I reached down, and I, and I picked up this little boy, and, and he was just filthy, dirty, head to toe, snot just running down his face. Face was caked with dirt. And I picked him up, and I sat him on my lap. What I didn't know was that one of our team members took a picture of it. And this is a picture of that, and I keep this picture in my office because this was a moment when my life was radically altered. So when I put that little boy on my lap, he just, he just reeked of urine. I, it, was, it was the stench, it was so overwhelming. But all I remember is it's, it smelled like the sweetest perfume and fragrance to me. See, here I thought I was going to Zambia and I was just going to go and on this huge mission trip. Man, I'm going to change the world. I mean, that was my mindset. That was everybody's mindset. And I had no idea that this simple little act of picking a little boy up and putting him on my lap and helping him to feel loved, that simple little act was going to be so significant not necessarily in his life, but in my life. I think that's what it's all about. So often we're, we're trying to figure out some big thing that I can do for Jesus. You know, I, I need to start some kind of big ministry. I've got, I need to go out into the world and do great things for the Lord. And you know, I've got to do these fancy big, big things. And what happens is when we start thinking too big, we get paralyzed and we end up doing nothing. And I really think what we need to do is we need to be looking at doing the simple. And I think it's, it's about all of us, 
everywhere, no matter where you are, it's all of us doing the simple. Come on, turn to somebody and tell them it's about doing something simple. Tell them, do something simple. Do something simple. It's, it's about doing the simple, and it's about all of us doing the simple acts that collectively add up to a significant impact. Imagine this, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people from Core Church all over the city, other states, around the world. Imagine if this week we go out and all of us just say, I'm just going to do one simple thing. I'm in the shadows. Nobody sees what I'm doing, but I'm going to do this simple little thing. I'm going to look for the intersection. I'm going to make a difference. Imagine the impact that we could have this week alone in our world. Intersections are not an inconvenience. They are an opportunity. And so often we just say, man, I'd help. I just don't know where to start. I, I don't know what to do. Can I tell you this? And I, I don't mean to say this, um, you know, to be, I'm not trying to be rude. Just look up. <laughs> There are needs everywhere. There, there is no shortage of problems. All you got to do is look up. You know, at the end of every service, we, we pray our sending prayer. God, fill me with love and give me boldness to share the hope, healing, peace, and purpose of Jesus. And every, every week we pray that prayer. I want to challenge you. What if you prayed that prayer every day through the Lent season, all the way up to Easter? I want to tell you, it is prayer that will open up your eyes. I pray this prayer every single morning when I get up. And I know that God then does two things. One, I'm saying, first of all, to God, I, I, I'm, I'm available. And then I'm saying to God, make me aware. I'm available, now make me aware. When you say that sending prayer, I just want to challenge you, but I also want to caution you. Don't pray that prayer unless you are ready to look and see the needs around you because when you pray that prayer, you're going to start seeing all these different intersections that are happening in your life that seem to be random, seem to be by chance and luck, and they're not going to be. Look, look at what, verse 15. So Jesus walks over, touches the coffin, and it says this, Then the dead boy sat up and he began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Honestly, this was bigger than just raising the dead. See, this, this is a widow, and this is, this is her only son. And in that culture and in that time period, if she didn't have a son or a husband, she was done. She was going to basically be living on the street and just living for scraps and probably not going to be just, be just be barely making it. So in this, Jesus is not only raising the dead, but he's also giving her her life back. So when, when, when you reach out, when... When you help someone, when God gives you this opportunity, he's giving you an opportunity every single day to give people their life back. That's what God wants to do through you every day, giving you opportunities to show kindness, to show love, to show grace, to show mercy, to show compassion, to, 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 to meet a need in a tangible way. This just happened to me just about a week ago in the middle of uh, the mess of the ice storm. It was last Saturday, and it was kind of, every day is kind of running together to me. I don't even remember really where it was in, in, the, uh, in, the, in that two-week window of all the mess we've had. I just remember that it led up, and it was Saturday. Sunday was going to be uh, Valentine's Day, and it was like seven degrees. There was ice all over the road, but we needed to get some supplies. So Laura and I took off and went to the grocery store. And here's the thing, uh, every guy knows this, the next day was Valentine's Day, which was pretty sweet for a lot of guys. I know you're like, hey, honey, you woke up the next day, you completely forgot on Sunday, you're like, oh, it's Valentine's Day, I completely forgot. But you didn't have to tell her that, you go, hey, I was going to get you something, but the weather's horrible, honey. I was going to take you to dinner, but you know, the weather's bad. But for me, here's the thing, I got to, I got to, tell you part of this story, otherwise it, the story won't make sense. So um, this is going to sound like I'm bragging, and it's because, well, because I'm bragging. Uh, so here's the thing. What I did is when Laura and I first got married, I, I determined and I said, you know what, I'm going to get you a rose for every year that we're married. Oh, because I just love you so much. Well, I wasn't anticipating that 
that God was going to change the course of my life and I wasn't going to be on the radio anymore and I wasn't going to make six figures. I was going, oh, I'm going to be a, a minister. And so it's turned into quite an ordeal for me every year. Uh, this year, 37 roses. That's how many she got. Now, that's important to this story. That's why I tell you that. Because if you do the math, you know, roses come in dozens, and that meant I needed one extra rose. And oh, by the way, Laura's mom and Aunt Mary, who are also with us, I needed to get them roses. And I'm not, I'm not going to leave them out. I'm not going to buy Laura roses and not buy them roses. And so I, I get them a dozen roses too. And so I decide to take one rose out of one of them and put it into Laura's. Now, don't judge me. Don't judge. You know, these. you, you go out and buy that many roses, and then we'll have a talk. So I take one of the roses, and I put it into Laura's. But then I've got a predicament. I've got 12 in one and 11 in the other. And I can just see it now. Aunt Mary and, and Laura's mom coming to fisticuffs, you know. Is it going to be like, you know, a WWE right there in our living room? Like, I can't believe he, he loves you more than he loves me. I just I couldn't have that. So I was like, okay, I, I'm going to have to give away one of their roses. So here we are. We're at the store. The next day is Valentine's Day. I can't, I'm not going to get out because the ice storm is coming. There's no way I'm going to get out on Sunday. I'm like, i got to buy the flowers now. So I go, hey, honey, I'll be right back. And I just went over and I got these roses. And I, I, I kid you not, I, I presented the roses to Laura in the produce section. <laughs> I was like, and here are your roses for Valentine's Day, my love. So funny because this one lady was standing over by the bananas and she was like, oh, my goodness, that is so beautiful. <laughs> so I give her her roses and, and I begin to tell her the predicament I'm in. And, and I said, okay, so I'm going to give one of these roses away. And so when I'm Checking out at the self-checkout, I, I think, okay, I just say a simple prayer. I said, hey, God, who would you like me to give this rose to? And so I, I pay for the roses, and, and, and I'm, I'm looking around, and I, I see a lady, and I'm like, well, I can't give her the roses, or the rose, because if I give her rose, here's the rose for you. She's probably going to think I'm hitting on her, and so that's probably, I mean, I just, it just didn't look appropriate. And, I, and then I was like, no, not that person. And just as I turned around, Right behind me at the self-checkout was a mother with her daughter who had Down syndrome, severe Down syndrome. And I knew that's the person I'm supposed to give the rose to. So I took the rose and I walked over and I just handed it to that girl. And, and then I was like, well, I can't just not give the mom one. So I went back, I got another rose and I handed it to the mom and I just said, hey, Happy Valentine's Day. I hope you guys have a great, great day. And Laura and I began to walk out of the store. And I mean, we were just, I couldn't believe that God did that. I was like, there's no way that was by chance. There's no way that was by accident. I mean, we pray, I prayed, you, we, you saw what happened. I mean, this is, this is God. This was an intersection. This is amazing. And, and, but here's the crazy thing. God wasn't done. So we're walking out of the store. Remember, it's like seven degrees, ice all over the ground. There's this older lady that's in front of us with her shopping cart, and it is packed full of groceries, and she's by herself. She's got like a 20-pound bag of cat food, and she's trying to get across the ice, and she's headed towards this handicapped space. And I said, hey, Laura, let's just go help her with her groceries. And so we walk over to her car, and I said, ma'am, can we help you put your groceries in the car? And she's like, oh, thank you. And I said, just get in, get warm. I mean, because it was so cold. I said, get in and get warm. And so we loaded up her groceries in her car, and and we said, hey, you have a great day. And we turned and we walked off. And right as I was turning to walk away, God says to me, give her a rose. So I, I turn around and I take a rose and I go and I tap on her window. And she rolls down her window. And I, and I didn't quite know how to begin the conversation. And I said, hey, um, is there, is there, is there anyone that's going to help you unload your groceries? And she said, yeah, my son is going to be there. He's going to help me. So then I just asked her, I said, do you, do you uh, tomorrow's Valentine's Day, do you, do you have a Valentine, somebody, somebody special? And she looks at me as tears start to form in her eyes, and she said, um, I lost my husband last September. And tears just started streaming down her face. And so I took the rose and I just handed it to her. And I said, hey, I just think God wants you to know and your husband wants you to know that, that, that he's thinking about you, he sees you, 
God loves you and your husband just wants you to know that, that he loves you. Happy Valentine's Day. And I turned and Laura and I walked off. It was just a simple act. Just a simple act that made a significant impact. See, intersections, they're, they're not an inconvenience. They're an opportunity. Every day matters. Every intersection matters. Nothing is by chance.